Good evening, everyone. My name is Bob Everline, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome Jay Forrester to, I believe it is the third fireside chat. This is a uh, tradition that started in Atlanta, in which we get Jay to come up and candidly answer some questions about things in his history. And the theme for tonight is the writings of Jay Forrester, specifically the books that he's written, Industrial Dynamics, Urban Dynamics and World Dynamics, as well as a book he has writing, Economic Dynamics. And here to ask questions of, the, of Jay is Khalid Saeed from the Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Thank you. I want to, to begin by saying a word about myself. I come from very modest beginnings in a remote village in Punjab. And system dynamics has changed my life, for better, for worse, but it has changed my life. You might ask how a poor village boy from Punjab got inducted into system dynamics. It all started in 1973 when I got a UK government scholarship to study for a master's in industrial engineering at the Asian Institute of Technology in Bangkok which is MIT of sorts for those who could not afford to go to the real place. There I would often have conversations about economic development that I had never studied but had lived through with Hal Holscher, president of AIT, who was very cordial to the students and who became my informal mentor. Hal one day offered to write about my interest to his old colleague and friend, Gordon Brown. Here is the letter he wrote. Uh, I don't know if you can read it. Uh, I have to admit that I did not live up to Hal's expectations, as in this letter, he thought I would end up heading the planning commission in my country of origin. That did not happen. The letter, however, got a response from Jay that encouraged me to send my application to the system dynamics program. And that's how I got here. It's indeed a great honor for me to moderate this fireside chat with Jay. Please join me in welcoming Jay Forrester. Jay, system dynamics changed my life, as I said. I now disagree with everybody around me on everything. <laughs> it is clearly a disruptive science. Our models seek counterintuitive insights that, that can often be controversial. Was there something in its design or in its beginning that led to its disruptive nature? Khalid has asked me to discuss the disruption caused by system dynamic studies. He wants to know if I started off expecting that. But I must say that at age 95, I'm feeling less disrupt disruptive than I used to be. <laughs> In fact, I wonder if we really want to be so disruptive and controversial uh, this evening. Of fire, firesides have several uses. They tell me there's a beautiful fire in a very elaborate uh, fireplace here. It must be behind me because I can't see it. <laughs> and I'm wondering if we should consider using it in some other way. Rather than being disruptive, how about being relaxed, taking life easy, sit back in your chairs, and have a nice fireside nap. <laughs> okay, nap time is over. <laughs> so it's time. <laughs> so now it's time to be disruptive. <clears throat> 
disruptive results are part of the landscape. They come with system dynamic. They're fundamental to a good system dynamic study. Let me discuss why. It depends on the nature of systems, real life systems. It depends on the nature of people. And it depends on the fundamental nature of system dynamics. If you look at real systems, we believe, not everybody believes this by a long way, we believe that the behavior of a system is caused and created by its internal structure and its internal policies. Unlike many people, we do not believe that troubles in the system come from heaven or, or random events, but rather that they are caused by the system itself. System dynamics looks at the nature of that system, and a good system dynamic study will, in a fairly simple model, show how and why the real system is causing any troubles that you might be encountering. <coughs> so, time after time, we've gone into real life systems, and we have found that people know exactly what they're doing. They have policies that they deeply believe in. And when you put those policies into a simulation model, you find that the model generates the trouble that they are in. In other words, it's the policies that they know they're following, that they're proud of following, and, the, and that they think will solve the problem at hand, which are causing the difficulty. Now, when that comes to light, and you show that, in fact, escaping the troubles in the system calls for reverting, reversing some of the church policies, that is where people come in. They don't like to be told that what they've been doing is causing the problems that they have been lamenting. They don't want to be told that they have to reverse those policies. It's very difficult for them. And this is the nature of people. So we have the nature of people, the real life system, system dynamic revealing the nature of that real life system. That leads to disruption. The disruption is the upset that the participant has as a result of the studies. In corporations, you don't see much in the way of aggressive responses to the idea of disruption. They just ignore it. That's yeah, not very disruptive. But in the social world, people can become very overwrought by suggesting that their policies are the cause of the problem. When urban dynamics came out, it produced a lot of controversy. A one full professor of social science at MIT walked up to me and he said, I don't care whether your book is right or wrong, it is unacceptable. <laughs> so much for academic objectivity. And uh, there is a big gap in our research work and the activities that system dynamics engage in, and that's how do you bridge the gap? How do you get people to accept that they've been doing the wrong thing? How do you get them to see, not only see it, but to act on it? It's fairly easy to get people to see that the policies need to be reversed, but it's a totally different matter to get them to do it. I work with one manufacturing company for quite some time and they were losing market share. They had lost market share steadily. And it turned out that they were losing market share because the entire company was deathly afraid of having excess inventory. And it manifested itself when there was a prospect of a recession in the offing and they would cut back production. 
Their loss of market share was always in the recessions because they cut back their production further than the market would have cut back the purchases. We had this model. I never met anybody in the company that differed with the model. They accepted the idea that they had to reverse those policies, but there was a problem. The policies had been the basis for three generations of top management making public speeches about their reasons for their success. The three generations of top management were all alive, all in town, all stockholders, and all on the board of directors. How does a recent graduate of the Harvard Business School come dare to reverse those policies in the interest of doing better with the company? I think it's a gesture of goodwill to me. They decided that in a forthcoming recession that was on the horizon, they would only cut back half as much as they had planned. They manufactured heavy equipment, engines in fact, and they would allocate some tens of millions of dollars to put those engines in the warehouse during the recession so that they could sell them when the market picked up. Well, as the saying went in the company, every time an engine was scheduled for the warehouse, some damn fool went and sold it. <laughs> they never got an engine in the warehouse. And the president, after the recession, said it had net $10 million net profit after taxes they otherwise would not have made. And in the next recession, they could not bring themselves to, bring it, to do it again. That's the power of tradition, the power of the circumstances around them. Uh, uh, talking about tradition, Jay, uh, there's a tradition in the academics about building on existing wisdom, existing literature. There existed a plethora of literature on every subject you have addressed in your models. Why did you not build on it and start it from scratch? Well, because in general, the literature does not deal with dynamics. It does not deal with how the pieces are related to each other. It's more, largely, more likely to be statistics of past behavior, which don't tell you much about dynamics. And you can spend a whole career reading the literature and get nowhere. It's my experience that you start with the knowledge of people in the field. Statistics are only a small, very small fraction of the available information. The overwhelming knowledge about real systems lies in people's heads. Maybe, maybe a tenth of that or a ten thousandth of that is to be found in the written literature, which again has a vastly more informative story than the statistics. And when you get down to the statistics, you're perhaps at a millionth of a millionth of the total picture. It's a very small basis to start working from. And uh, in urban dynamics, urban dynamics arose because of John Collins, who had been a mayor of Boston for eight years, grown up in Boston politics, democratic politics, and he'd had polio in a epidemic of the mid-50s. He walked with two arm canes. He had to have an office in a building that had automobile access to the elevator level. My building was one, only one at that time that qualified. The professor in the next office was on leave. Through a series of happenstances, Collins ended up in the office next to me. So I talked to him about his background with cities. This was a time when the urban crisis was the headline news in the newspapers. Buildings, uh, cities were 
had riots, they had fires. The big news was the problems in the city. So I talked to him about this. He didn't have quite his full quota of those problems, but he discussed what they were doing in cities to help alleviate the situation. <coughs> and I began to get a feeling that I had come to recognize in the corporate world. And that is that everything he said seemed to make sense on the surface, and yet he doubted that it, un that it ha would hang together underneath the surface. So I suggested to him we might combine our, my background and his, and see if we could shed any light on it. So he said, okay, how do we start? And I said, well, we're not going to find out what we want in our urban systems department. We're not going to find out what we want in the urban systems library. We're going to have to have maybe six or eight people who have been battling these problems, working with them, struggling with them for years. And we should get, to get, get them together for a long discussion every Wednesday afternoon for we do not know how many weeks. Johnson and, uh, and Collins was a man of action. He says, they will be here Wednesday afternoon. Collins' position in Boston was that he could ask almost any businessman or politician for the Wednesday afternoons for ever. And so we had our meetings. The aerodynamic study was the first and only one I've ever gone into where I had no idea what we would do, no idea whether we could succeed, no idea whether there was going to be a system there that made sense. Every other situation, corporate, economic, I have known we could do it and approximately how to go about it. So for six or eight weeks, these conversations went on, wandering, contradictory, apparently going nowhere, and I was spending something like 30 hours a week between them trying to figure out whether anything had been said that would be a useful model. I would make some sketches, look at them and say those won't go anywhere and discard them. Until one Sunday morning, by some sort of intuition or happenstance, I sketched the block diagram that opens the Urban Dynamics book. The nine stalks, three ages of, of corporate business buildings, three ages of housing, and three kinds of people. And you could see immediately what was going to happen. As the business structures age, they had lower and lower occupancy, fewer and fewer people per square foot as the buildings became less and less satisfactory. On the other hand, as high price premium housing decayed, the occupancy went up, up per square foot. <coughs> and that's basically what the model shows. When you have the stocks down, I prefer to model by identifying the stocks that I want to work with. I do not start with causal diagrams or <coughs> some of the things that are very popular. Start with the stocks. And remember, we're talking about endogenous systems. The system is internally causing its problems. Nine stocks, that's going to do it. Everything else is fairly straightforward. There flows in, there flows out. Everyone has to have a reason for flowing, and so you control it from the available stocks. It turns out that almost every flow had some input from almost every stock in that model. And it showed how growth, there may be a 100-year growth phase where Businesses are being created in the space of the city and they're attracting in people. But there's a shortage of housing. And so you've had a hundred years of, of stability in the sense that you had 
had jobs always ahead of, of occupancy, that the opportunity for jobs always was high and the availability of housing was low and the uh, equilibrium was being established by jobs pulling in and housing keeping people out. Then as the land filled up, this totally reversed in 50 or so years. And now the housing is in excess, the jobs are low, and you have people being pulled in by the housing and kept out by the economic distress. Uh, and none of that would have come out of the literature. And one of the things I think that annoyed economists more than anything else about world dynamics is that it does, it does cite two sources. One, the World Almanac, and the other, the Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> and that is a heresy to settle for those. Um, one question. Um, I, I think you did a great job using experiential information to create theories. To create what? Theories. Uh, you, you, to create your theories, you did a great job to use exper experiential information. No. Uh, whereas the tradition in academics is using literature. And I just want to ask you, uh, in your opinion, is that as tradition of using literature a help or hindrance to innovation? Well, I saw a quote here very recently, a quote from Kenneth Boulding, who was a well-known but controversial economist, who said there are only two classes of people who don't understand economic growth. And one of them was economists. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they, they really don't recognize the power of exponential growth. It doesn't look like much until you get to some point. You can double it every 30 years for hundreds of years in population, and you still don't work. And the last 30 years becomes overwhelming. And uh, that's not really seen by most people. It can be seen by first and second graders. We are using, developing a foundation under kindergarten through 12th grade education based on system dynamics. It's much easier to teach system dynamics in grades one through eight than it is any time later because they have a lot less to unlearn. And uh, all the fundamental ideas can be grasped in the first few years. There have been people quite successfully teaching kindergartners the importance of stocks and flows. The water in the bathtub is a stock. The flows are obvious. Your reputation is a stock. The good and bad things you do are the flows. And they can go through their environment and find the stocks and the flows. And by fifth and sixth grade, they can be doing computer simulation models that for the most part are now being taught in graduate school. Let me, let me jump to uh, another subject. You have talked about long wave way back in the 1980s. Uh, do you think long wave exists in U.S. economy? Where do we currently stand on it? Well, I very much believe that the long wave does exist. It, it explains the Great Depression of the 30s. There has not been in economic literature any accepted general um, discussion or description of what caused the Great Depression. For the most part, people see it as just a bad business cycle downturn. It's an entirely different phenomenon. The business cycle is largely the rise and fall of consumer inventories. The long way goes back into the capital sectors and it's largely a rise and fall in the capital sectors. And you saw here not too long ago housing 
was expanded and expanded and expanded to a point where the debt that, su that supported the expansion was intolerable. The number of housing, the housing was beyond what the occupants could in fact afford. And then you have a crash where people stopped buying and the capital producing sectors almost go out of business. And we're in now, I believe, one of the long wave bottom downturns. And every time there's a little uptick, the newspapers talk about how now the recession is ending. Well, first of all, it's not a recession. It's something entirely different. And then, a little while later, as of right now, well, maybe the recession isn't going to recover. Maybe it's going to level up. Maybe it'll even turn back down. What we're seeing is the business cycle, which still is alive, operating along the bottom of the economic long wave. So the economic long waves are a great deal more than just a rise and fall of activity. They change the very nature of what's going on. The downturns are times for the major technological changes. In the 30s, you went from railroads before the 30s to airplanes afterward. You went from radio to television. You went from people living in cities near where they worked to the automobile in the suburbs. And it's unclear now what this next kind of major change is going to be. But it's going to take 10 or 20 years to find out. And so we're going to be moving along, feeling things out, giving up cherished past technologies to be replaced with, uh, with others. And there is a very interesting one-person simulation model to show a piece, just one, one, one of four or so dynamic mechanisms of the long way. Uh, the so-called self-ordering. A capital sector, if you take all the capital sectors in their entirety, if they are going to expand their capital plan, they have to expand it with their own output. And that's the basis for the little model that I want to describe. Everything that's going on is on the screen in front of you, the computer screen. Some orders are coming in from the lower right corner, and they go into an order backlog to be supplied capital, but from the capital sector that you are running. And you are running every month, you decide whether you need more capital plant or less. No labor, no prices. You make capital plant with capital plant. That's all there is to the technology. If you want to expand the capital plant, you must order more, but it has to come from you. So your orders go into the same order backlog that other people do. And as you get your share of the output, you can expand your capital plant. That's all there is to it. Essentially, everyone will, will run this in such a way that they have huge fluctuations of the capital sector with peaks 40, 50, 60 years apart. You're seeing a piece of the long way there. I watched it one day with two people cooperating on what to do. One was one of our phone school economists, and the other was the recently retired manufacturing vice president of TRW. They had the result of everybody else. Huge fluctuations, 40, 50 years between peaks. The economist was absolutely sure he'd been tricked some way because that couldn't happen. I turned to the retired manufacturing vice president. I said, do you, do you see any reality here? And he said, I have relived my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the economists are not in touch with the real world. Uh, on, on that same subject, uh, you mentioned that uh, when we recover from this, this bottoming out, there will be many new technologies Will one of these be a complete change in economics? Will do you think that a revolution will ever happen in the field of economics, which I guess uh, I sense from your conversation is very sophisticated but not extremely useful? 
would a change occur in that field too? Well, the, there are several things going on in economics, and I think generally your question and general talk applies to what is referred to as the mainstream economics. This is what would be taught at MIT, Columbia, and Chicago, and Stanford, and the main big well-known universities. But there's a lot going on besides that. There are doctoral students in many places that are rebelling against mainstream economics. Strong movement in France, strong movement in some of the other lesser universities in this country. But the mainstream economists have a tremendously strong self-contained paradigm. You do not change paradigms easily or quickly. For example, it was only in 1950, 50 years ago, that the Catholic Church finally admitted that Galileo had been right. A few hundred years to change that paradigm. Uh, I do not think for a moment that we're going to convert mainstream economists. Maybe a few, but probably not. Because first of all, they have excelled in the profession. And if they were to go to system dynamics, this is another profession. It will take them as long to learn as it took them to learn their own business. System dynamics is at least as complicated as medicine or engineering. If you want to come to the top of the list of skills, you have three, four, five years of study, and they're not about to do it. So I think what we'll see in that future is not the conversion of mainstream economists, but their replacement. That they will be replaced, they will be gradually overwhelmed, and, they, and you will all have to outlive them. <laughs> uh, one more question from me, and then we'll open to the floor. Jay, what do you think you'll be known for in about 20 years? Say that again? What do you think you'll be known for in about 20 years? That's much too short a time. I would rather talk about what would be named for, um, thought of, thought, remind, remembered for 50 or 80 years from now. Let's, let's do that. Because the whole future, the possibilities of system dynamics are so huge that it's going to take a very long time for the main part of it to take shape. Just for example, one thing that we should look forward to is a replacement of differential equations in the engineering and the social sciences. And uh, differential equations have been the fundamental way of dealing with dynamics. It is terribly misleading. It causes a great deal of harm. And there are reasons for this. Mathematicians have had some difficulty defining a derivative, and there is a reason. There is no such thing. Nowhere in engineering, science, social affairs, nowhere in the real world is a derivative taken. Nature only integrates. Nature only accumulates. And as soon as you approach it from that point, any child who can fill a water glass or take toys away from a playmate knows what accumulation is. So they can move into complex systems and never discover that they're difficult. And I had two doctoral students from our Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. They've had all of the math, all the theory about solid state physics. They came over and they built a system dynamics model, one or two levels about what was going on in the electron cloud at the contact point of a transistor. 
They said it was the first time they ever understood what was happening. The differential equations had completely obscured the reality of what was going on. I have had MIT students argue aggressively with me that the water flows out of the faucet because the water in the glass is rising. That's what the differential equation says. And it, it causes a reverse sense of causality in many students, and it totally obscures the dynamics in most of the others. So, I would like to be known for having thrown out differential equations in all fields. Would you ask so, this, this, this is not going to be by the next 50 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I would like to be known by having completely replaced economics, and that's not going to mean in 25 years either. <laughs> and there are two or three others, but that's enough for now. <laughs> uh, the floor is now open for questions about Jay's work. That's the theme of this evening's. Uh, far side chat. Uh, uh, please, everybody, everybody should use a microphone. Jay, did you see the uprising by the poor or the middle class in some of these regions in the world today as some kind of a rebellion against traditional policies, social policies? Do you see uprisings in the lower, middle and lower classes as a rebellion against policies in the region? Well, I think you need to look at Greece for our future. The kinds of, and you also need to look at the several major characteristics of complex systems. You will find them, first of all, in my urban dynamics book, but I've included them in a number of papers more recently. And the one that's most obvious and most often missed is the idea that a policy that's good in the short run is almost always bad in the long run, and vice versa. Now, we have countries all around the world who have been following, finding, fo fo following policies that were good in the short run, namely paying more and more people for more and more uh, health, paying more and more retirees for good living, and then the corporations, the cities like Detroit, and the countries really come to a point where they cannot continue that. Then the public reaction is going to be much more violent than if they had in the first place said we're not going to be able to do it in the future, so we'll adjust now, like 30, 40, 50 years ago. So I think the answer is yes. If you look at Greece, there are riots in the streets. I think we should take Greece as a good indication of the future of the United States. We are expanding, we're building a, a government debt that cannot be sustained, and the debt is continuing to spiral upward. It's true in cities, it's true in states, it's true in corporations. It's true in many individuals' lives. And those, the stresses from that are, I think, not far away in the future. So the answer to your question is yes, there will be a great deal of social disturbance. And it won't be just the poor people. I mean, it's all, it's the, the the people who are getting uh, retirement funds that are quite satisfactory now, but are not going to get it. They'll be equally stressed. Jay, a few years ago you asked us to be brave, right? the, the field and the researchers, to be brave and tackle the big problems. If you were 24, you know, just starting your career again, which problems would you tackle? Which of the big problems would you tackle? 
Well, you need to follow a big, important problem. A system dynamics model of a minor problem is not going to cause much disruption because it doesn't matter. And I would say the, ma the, the measure of a good model might be taken as the degree of disruption that it causes. Now, the question is what to do with that disruption because it may get totally ignored. That's where I said we need to have some real studies on how to, how to make disruptive recommendations effective and followed. But to go further with the question, the headlines are just full of good topics for major system dynamics books. And I don't see enough people, I don't see any people really writing books of the sort that produced the public reactions and the public understanding that came with urban dynamics and world dynamics. Those produced tremendous responses, but responses that didn't necessarily take immediate root. World dynamics, I thought, when it was published, I had everything necessary to guarantee that there would be no public notice. To start with, it has about 40 pages of equations in the middle of it. That should be sufficient. It was brought out by a publisher that had published one previous book, probably did not have the commercial status to get reviewed. All the interesting material were computer-generated graphs that most people can't read. And the interesting material was 50 or 100 years in the future and well beyond anybody's normal time horizon. I thought it was for 20, 30, 40 people in the world that had computers and would like to put it on and kind of see what you could do. Okay. <clears throat> so the book came out the first week of June of 1941. The last week of June it was reviewed, I believe, on the front page of the London Observer with trust circulated around the world at that time. I received a letter from a professor in one of the State Universities of New York saying he would like to know more about what we were doing because he'd been reading about it in the Singapore Times. The book had the full front page of the second section of the Christian Science Monitor in July. It had a page and a half in Fortune in September. It had a column or two in the Wall Street Journal in October. It was running through the editorial columns of mid-American newspapers. It was running through the Zero Population Growth Press, the Anti-Establishment Underground Student Press. It was the subject of a half-hour prime-time television documentary in Europe. And if you don't like your literature on either the establishment right or the establishment left, it had a full-length article in Playboy. <laughs> it seemed as if everything that could happen in the media had happened as a result of world dynamics. And Linux to Growth came out nine months later. Basically the same story, pretty much the same draft. They had a year of further work to kind of validate it and make sure that the back-of-the-envelope assumptions in world dynamics really stood up. It came out nine months later. Many people assumed it would be an anticlimax because there was basically nothing new in it. There were no equations. It was much more popularly written. And it just shows you can be wrong twice in a row in exactly the same way. The public interest when Limits to Growth came out was at least a factor of 10 about where it had been. Limits to Growth sold 400,000 copies in the first summer in the Dutch translation alone. It has now sold, I don't know how many, 30, 40 million copies. It's been translated into probably 40 languages. I received the Vietnamese translation of Limits to Growth right in the middle of the U.S. Vietnam War. 
I could not see the relevance of it to that situation. So, I would say there's room for other books of equal impact dealing with the headlines of the times. There's the whole social security issue, which is not understood by most people. <coughs> there are the international problems. There are a whole list of problems. I mean, look at Europe. Europe has been trying to get itself out of this debt crisis by temporizing. They're going to have to default on that debt, and if they do it sooner, they'll get out sooner. Uh, you, you can look around the world, you find these problems everywhere. And we do need to be bold, courageous, and go where the problems are rather than retreating into academia or some corner of a corporation. So would, would this be uh, what one small question and then uh, we can go back to the audience. Would this be popular books? What kind of books would these be on these big, big subjects? Uh, would these be academic books? Would these be popular books? Who would publish them? The address must be the public, and that's the problem. Anybody that writes books in universities, well, first of all, books don't count for, for advancement. It's only papers in, in the reference journals that account for uh, promotion. And almost nobody going to read those papers. Somebody made a study of the number of readers of published scientific papers and came out with saying there's one and a half readers per paper. <laughs> Not true with the good papers, on the average probably is true. And uh, so I would say that as long as the target audience are the professional journals. If system dynamicists are writing letter, papers for system dynamicists, this will lead nowhere. And I think you can't explain a story in a journal article, even if it's in a public journal. So I, I favor the books. I think the books are, are necessary to reach the public, and you can. You can reach the public with models, if they're simple enough. Urban dynamics and world dynamics were on the list of reading for parent teachers associations, and uh, other public groups of that sort. So you want to write a book that can be picked up and read by anybody, at least by 95% of the public, and make it clear, and make it understandable, and hit the, hit the big controversies with what needs to be done, and be disruptive, and then follow up. Now, there's no follow up from world dynamics or urban dynamics really, well, the limits of growth laws, but there's not been much follow-up from any of us on keeping the fire alive and keeping the controversy going. And so there's a place there for other people to step in behind such a book and try to keep the message alive, keep people talking about it, trying to overcome this tendency to reject controversial ideas. Thank you. Other, other questions? Other? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Forrester, let me say just one thing and then I'll ask my question. Uh, as one Nebraska graduate from another, I just want to thank you uh, for uh, your career of work. I really appreciate it. Um, I also want to say that I am a sociologist, a social scientist, have been embedded in, in social sciences for uh, quite a while, and I have only recently stumbled across uh, system dynamics as a methodology as a tool, largely because some of the other methodologies I've been using in the past 
we're not capable of actually addressing this particular problem. So I'm very much a novice in trying to learn uh, this tool uh, later in my career. But I'm curious to know, really, and you've addressed some of this already, but I'm curious to know why sociology in particular um, has, uh, from your perspective, not, uh, not only not adopted, but not really apparently been aware uh, of the value of system dynamics. I've gone back in the American Sociological Review, American Sociological, American Journal of Sociology, Sociological Methodology, and found only one um, essay uh, written by Nathan Kiefitz in 1979 uh, that said anything, um, of one way or another, about system dynamics. So I would be very interested to know if there are other studies out there uh, that have incorporated it from a social science or a, a uh, sociological perspective, uh, and, uh, and, and so we get a good sense from you as to why uh, sociology and the social sciences have largely been aware uh, of the importance of uh, this methodology. Well, my impression is that the sociology area is much more amenable to system dynamics than let's say becomes. And I have the impression that it has been fairly fairly well received in political science. I did attend very briefly a little a small conference of 30 people or so in political science, all of which were interested in the application of system dynamics. Now some of those kinds of activities die out, but here I have I've been told by people who just come up and talk to me about how they have a strong presence in one kind of social science or another. So it's slow because it's not easy to learn. It's slow because of the silo effect of publishing articles only in your own journals and uh, you don't really get much exposure to other things. And it's also because system dynamicists have probably not expended the effort they should to write useful papers in those other fields. Uh, or exciting papers in the other fields. Exciting papers. Papers that are challenging. Papers that make people stop and think. There's a great opportunity for doing system dynamics models of the theories, the descriptive theories that exist in those fields that have essays as the basis for their interchange. And so, but they all talk about this leads to this, this leads to this, this is the way it works. And then there, there's information about what is happening and do not realize that the structure they laid out will not lead to the assumptions that they assume or to the repeat behavior they assume. There's a great opportunity for system dynamics modeling. Bear in mind, system a system dynamics model is a theory of behavior. It's a theory in the same sense as Einstein's law is a theory. It's a theory in the same sense as Ohm's law in electroengineering. It is a theory that does not necessarily come from statistical history, probably does not, none of those did. It's a theory that you arrive at by observing the real world, and then you test it against any kind of data you may have from the real world. Einstein's theory is still open to debate. They're still finding things that are going to be proofs or disproofs of it. So far, it stood up very well. Uh, but I think that we could make a lot of progress by, by writing, read the literature, enough of it to get a story about something, and then model it. Uh, one that has been done, there is in economics something called the multiplier accelerator theory of the business cycle. It's basically if demand goes up then the manufacturing sectors need more capital and they order it and they hire more people and uh, 
more people get more wages and uh, we have more demand and they can buy more goods. And it's an explanation of how business cycle may expand. I don't think it says much about why it turns over and goes down. But it is explicit in the literature. You can do it. My son Nathan did it and others have in their doctoral thesis. I mean, these kinds of things are good for doctoral thesis material. And uh, what you find is that the multiplier accelerator theory can not cause a business cycle. There are no plausible assumptions to put in that structure that will produce a periodicity less than many decades between peaks. It is a part of the long way. So we have in economics a verbal descriptive theory about the business cycle that cannot possibly be that in the part of the long wave that they deny could possibly exist. There is a room for a lot of disruption in the social sciences by going in and studying their Assum their assumptions, their descriptive models, and then finding out that the story does not hang together. Thank you. Um, it seems we have come to the end of. Uh, can one more question, or can we? Um, one last question. Yes. Could you say a little bit more about your innovating work with children and what you expect to come of this? About what? The innovating work with children, the K-12 education. Oh, mm -hmm. Yes, this is a new pioneering field. K we're talking about K-12 system dynamics as a foundation for K-12 education. It's a pioneering field. It's been in the way for several decades now. Very slowly growing, being explored. It is timely for a major expansion, except that we haven't found the funding yet to do that. Uh, it is much easier to teach system dynamics in the first eighth grade than it will ever be afterward. It's easier in the eighth grade than high school, much easier in high school and college, but graduate school system dynamics becomes very difficult because the, eighth, the first eight grades, they have much less to unlearn. A child, I think, understands dynamics and the whole educational system is devoted to stamping that out. It starts, starts right in the family. The child wants to know, why this? Ask questions. And what he learns is that the parent doesn't know the answer and furthermore the atmosphere is you should not ask questions like that. So it strikes out innovation, the educational system does, it suppresses inquiry and it is very counter to what I refer to as the important dynamic understanding. Now what is going on? Not enough. But there have been examples of teaching kindergartners to understand the reality and importance of stocks and flows. I may have mentioned this a moment ago, but uh, it's not hard. It's an absolutely fundamental building block of system dynamics. And you can see the water, that's the stock in the bathtub. You can understand the flows in and out, but then pretty soon you're understanding that your reputation is a stock and the good and bad things you do are the flows and that it applies everywhere to everything. Then there is the idea that all things that change through time are controlled by a feedback loop. Everything that changes through time is controlled by a feedback loop and to begin to see these feedback loops. And in simpler cases, they're quite evident if they are pointed out. <coughs> and as they go along, they can get not just a single feedback loop, but multiple ones that are beginning to 
interconnect with, with each other. And one of the things that we're working on now, I want to work up to, is to instill in students from kindergarten through high school a deep emotional understanding of those several general characteristics of complex systems that, for which I have written up in a number of places. The one I mentioned, that policy is good in the short run, are bad in the long run, and so forth. Another one deals with how the standards and the values of a system can erode with time under pressure, spiral downward. You can see it in new corporations that start with high standards, and a lot of them, the standards for quality, the standards for good delivery life, they start out with a set of standards that are impossible, but then they have to yield on some of them. But they keep yielding, and pretty soon they're out of business. Now a corporation that doesn't go that full route has other feedback systems in it that are holding up the value structure. Usually they are stories created by the chief executive. If you go into a corporation that is unique, it can be bad, it can be unusually good, it's unique, it's different. And you ask somebody why, why is, it, why is this so different? And they're apt to come back at you with this saying, well, let me tell you a story. And the story illustrates what we stand for here. And they are stories usually created by the chief executive officer who has stood up against adversity, who has maintained the standards, who has created a story that reverberates through the organization. So that, that matter of the collapse of gold is, is on them. And there are three or four more of them. And we would like to have students come out of 12th grade truly believing them. I mean, they emotionally believe them. They fundamentally believe them. You will not, under, you will not believe them by having them read to you. You will not hear them, believe them from a lecture. I think it's necessary for them to see those structures and processes in models, in literature, in the newspaper of the day, in what's going on around them, and to do this continuously for 12 years. I think it will take that long to have a feeling that they really have mastered those ideas and can look at the world around them and react accordingly. We could have a very different kind of society if the if enough of the public had that kind of background. I don't think it needs everyone. It could maybe it might be as low as ten percent of the people if they had that kind of background could carry a whole society. Uh, sorry. Uh, let me see. I was going to say then that right now, system dynamics is being taught at many different parts of the educational system. Second graders get things about exponential growth. Uh, introduction to, uh, to system dynamics gets taught in different schools at different levels, but there is no continuous cumulative structure of education yet anywhere. The pieces are all mostly there. I have tried my hand, not very successfully and not very aggressively, to raise a hundred million dollars, which is would, would boost this for the next ten years. There was, six or eight years ago, a one-week study group. It had maybe eight teachers who had been involved in this, and four or five of the top people in system dynamics devoted to the long-term future of system dynamics in K-12 education. It was intensive, and the upshot was that we did a, a diagram, a Excel chart if you like, year by year for 25 years, a dozen or so different things that had to be done, and every square filled in as to what would be the state of affairs and how much time 
and if it would have to be devoted to it. And the upshot of the 25 years was roughly to say that in 25 years we could probably convert maybe a third of the U.S. schools to a systematics foundation at a cost of around two billion dollars. Now two billion dollars is small change compared to what's going on being spent in education. And a hundred million, that is a exponentially growing cost, a hundred million is geared to the first ten years of that, that progression. If any of you know somebody that has an excess hundred million dollars, and there are a lot of such people, uh, see if you can get in touch with them. Uh, a government, government is not thought of as a good sponsor because they don't have any long-term time horizon. They don't have in them people that dare take on highly controversial issues. And the big foundations are not useful because they have fallen into the hands of middle-level bureaucrats. The ideal person to try to get in contact with is someone who has made his own fortune, who has not yet set up a foundation, and has a guilty conscience about his money. James, you have a lot to think about, and uh, we'll all go home and, and uh, put our minds to what he has said. Thank you very much, Jay. Let me please join me in giving Jay, Jay a big hand. <laughs>